Raven of World by Alex Huxley. Chapter 8. Outside of the dust and among the garbage, there were four dogs now. Bernard and John were walking slowly up and down. So hard for me to realize, Bernard was saying, to reconstruct, as though we're living on different planets, in different centuries. A mother and all this dirt, and gods and old age and disease? He shook his head. It's almost inconceivable. I shall never understand unless you explain. Explain what? This, he indicated the Pueblo. That, and it was the little house outside the village. Everything, all your life. But what is there to say? From the beginning, as far back as you can remember. As far back as I can remember. John frowned. There was a long silence. It was very hot. They had eaten a lot of tortillas and sweet corn. Linda said, Come and lie down, baby. They lay down together in the big bed. Sing, and Linda sang. Sang, struck cock to G. Banbury T. And by baby banting, soon you'll be the camkin. Her voice got fainter and fainter. There was a loud noise, and he woke with a start. A man was saying something to Linda, and Linda was laughing. She had pulled the blanket up to her chin, but the man pulled it down again. His hair was like two black ropes, and round his arm was a lovely silver bracelet with blue stones in it. He liked the bracelet, but uh, with all the saying, he was frightened. He hid his face against Linda's body. Linda put her hand on him, and he felt safer. And those other words he did not understand so well, she said to the man, Not with John here. The man looked at him, then again at Linda, and said a few words in a soft voice. Linda said, No. But the man bent over the bed towards him, and his face was huge, terrible. The black ropes of hair touched the blanket. No, Linda said again, and he felt her hand squeezing him more tightly. No! No! But the man took hold of one of his arms, and it hurt. He screamed. The man put up his other hand and lifted him up. Linda was still holding him, still saying, No, no. The man said something short and angry, and suddenly her hand were gone. Linda! Linda! He kicked and wriggled, but the man carried him across the door, opened it, put him on the, put him down on the floor in the middle of the other room, and went away, shutting the door behind him. He got up. He ran to the door. Standing on tiptoe, he could just reach the big wooden latch. He lifted it, pushed, but the door wouldn't open. Linda! He shouted. She didn't answer. He remembered a huge room, rather dark, and there were big wooden things with strings fastened to them, and lots of women standing around them, making blankets, Linda said. Linda told him to sit in the corner with the other children while she went and helped the women. He played with the little boys for a long time. Suddenly people started talking very loud, and there were women pushing Linda away, and Linda was crying. She went to the door and he ran after her, and he asked her why they were angry. Because I broke something, she said, and then she got angry too. How would I know how to use their beastly, how to do their beastly weaving, she said. Beastly savages! He asked her what savages were. When they got back to the house, Pope was waiting at the door, and he came in with them. He had a big gourd full of stuff that looked like water, only it wasn't water. It was something that, with a bad smell that burned your mouth and made you cough. Linda drank some, and Pope drank some, and then Linda laughed a lot and, they, and talked very loud. And then she and Pope went into the other room. When Pope went away, he went into the room. Linda was in the bed and so fast asleep that he couldn't wake her. Pope used to come often. He said the stuff in the gourd was called mescal, but Linda said it ought to be called Soma, only it made you feel ill afterwards. He hated Pope, hated them all, all the men who came to see Linda. One afternoon, when he had been playing with the other children, it was cold, he remembered, and there was snow in the mountains. He came back to the house and heard angry voices in the bedroom. They were women's voices, and they said words he didn't understand, but he knew they were dreadful words. Then suddenly, crash! Something was upset. He heard people moving about quickly, and there was another crash, and then a noise like hitting a mule, only not so bony. Then Linda screamed, Oh no, don't, 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 she said. He ran in. There were three women in dark blankets, and Linda was on the bed. One of the women was holding her wrist, the other was laying across her legs so that she couldn't kick. The third was hitting her with a whip. Once, twice, three times, and each time Linda screamed. Crying, he tucked at the fringe of the woman's blanket. Please, please! With her free hand, she held him away. The whip came down again, and Linda screamed. He caught hold of the woman's enormous brown hand between his own, and bit it with all his might. She cried out, wrenched her hand free, and gave him such a push that he fell down. While he was lying on the ground, she hit him three times with the whip. It hurt more than anything he had ever felt, like fire. The whip whistled again, but this time it was Linda who screamed. But why do they want to hurt you, Linda? he asked that night. He was crying because the red marks of the whip on his back still hurt so terribly. But he was also crying because people were so beastly and unfair. And he was 
and because he was only a little boy and couldn't do anything against them. Linda was crying too. She was a grown-up, but she wasn't big enough to fight against three of them. It wasn't fair for her either. Why do they hurt you, Linda? I don't know. How should I know? It was difficult for us to hear what she said, because she was lying on her stomach and her face was on the pillow. They say those men are their men, she went on, and she did not seem to be talking to him at all. She seemed to be talking to someone inside herself. Inside herself. <clears throat> a long talk, which she didn't understand. And in the end, she started crying louder than ever. Oh, don't cry, Linda, don't cry. He pressed himself against her, and he put his arm around her neck. Linda cried out, Oh, be careful, my shoulder, oh! And she pushed him away. His head banged against the wall. Little idiot, she shouted, and then suddenly she began to slap him. Slap, slap. Linda, he cried out, Oh, mother, don't. I'm not your mother. I won't be your mother. But Linda, oh, he sl she slapped him on the cheek. Turned into a savage, she shouted, having young ones like an animal. If it hadn't been for you, I might have gone to the inspector. I might have gone away, but not with a baby. That would have been too shameful. He saw that she was going to hit him again and lifted his arm to guard his face. Oh, don't, Linda, please don't. Little beast, she pulled out his arm. His face was uncovered. Don't, Linda. He shut his eyes, expecting the blow. But she didn't hit him. After a time, he opened his eyes again and saw that she was looking at him. He tried to smile at her, and suddenly she put her arms round him and kissed him again and again. Sometimes, for several days, Linda didn't get up at all. She lay in bed and was sad, or else she drank the stuff that milk they were and laughed a great deal and went to sleep. Sometimes she was sick. Sometimes she forgot to wash him, and there was nothing to eat. And there was nothing to eat except cold tortillas. You remember the first time she found the little animals in his hair and how she screamed and screamed? The happiest times were when she told him about the other place. And you can really go flying whenever you like? <clears throat> whenever you like. And she would tell him about the lovely music that came out of a box, and all the nice games you could play, and the delicious things to eat and drink, and the light that came when you pressed on the little thing on the wall, and the pictures you could hear and feel and smell, as well as see, and another box for making nice smells, and the pink and green and blue and silver houses as high as mountains, and everybody happy, and no one ever sad or angry, and everyone belonging to everyone else, and the boxes where you could see and hear whatever was happening on the other side of the world, and babies in lovely clean bottles, everything so clean and no nasty smells, no dirt at all, and people never lonely, but living together and being so jolly and happy like the summer dances here in my place, but much happier, and the happiness being there every day, every day. He listened by the hour, and sometimes when he and the other children were tired with too much playing, one of the old men of the club would talk to them of those other words of the great transformer of the world and the long flight between right hand and left hand. <clears throat> And the long fight between right hand and left hand, and the long fight between and the long fight between right hand and left hand, and those long and the long fight between uh, <coughs> wet and dry of I know why we are long now. A W O N A W I L O N A, who made a great fog by thinking in the night and. Then made the world, the whole world, out of the fog, of Mother Earth and Sky Father, of Hawaii, Utah, and A H A I U Y U T A, and Marsilema, M A R S I L E M A, the twins of War and Chances, of Jesus and Pukam, of Mary and Estosanatlihi. E T S A N A T L E H I, the woman who makes herself young again, of the black stone at Laguna and the great eagle and Our Lady of Acuma. Strange stories, all the more wonderful to him for being told in the other words, and so not fully understood. Lying in bed, he could think of heaven and London and Our Lady of Acoma, and the rows and rows of bottles of babies and clean bottles and Jesus flying up and Linda flying up and the great director of the world, Patrice. <laughs> of the world hatcheries and I wanna we Lona. Lots of men came to see Linda. Boys began to point their fingers at him. In the strange other words, they said that Linda was bad. They called her names he did not understand, but he knew they were bad names. One day they sang a song about her again and again. He threw stones at them. They threw them back. A sharp stone cut his cheek. The blood wouldn't stop. He was covered with blood. 
Linda taught him to read. The pieces of charcoal she drew pictures on the wall. An animal sitting down, a baby inside a bottle. Then she wrote the letters. The cat is on the mat. The tot is in the pot. He learned quickly and easily. When he knew how to read all the words she wrote on the wall, Linda opened her big wooden box and pulled out from under those funny little red trousers she never wore a thin little book. He had often seen it before. When you're bigger, she had said, you can read it. Well, now he was big enough. He was proud. I'm afraid you won't find it very exciting, she said. But it's the only thing I have, she sighed. If only you could see the lovely reading machines we used to have in London. He began reading. The chemical and bacteriological conditioning of the embryo, practical instructions for beta embryo sewer workers. It took him a quarter of an hour to read the title of mom. He threw the book on the floor. Beastly, beastly book, he said, and began to cry. The boys still sang their horrible song about Linda. Sometimes, too, they laughed at him for being so ragged. When he tore his clothes, Linda didn't know how to mend them. In the other place, she told him, people threw away clothes with holes in them and got new ones. Rags, rags, the boys used to shout at him. But I can read, he said to himself, and they can't. They don't even know what reading is. It was fairly easy, if he thought hard enough about what reading, about the reading, to pretend that he didn't mind when they made fun of him. He asked Linda to give him the book again. The more the boys pointed and sang, the harder he read. Soon he could read all the words quite well, even the longest. But what did they mean? He asked Linda, but she even when she couldn't answer, it didn't seem like it made it was very clear. And generally, she couldn't answer at all. What are chemicals, he would ask. Oh, stuff like magnesium, salts, and alcohol for keeping the deltas and epsilons small and backwards, and calcium carbonate for bones, and that sort of thing. But how do you make chemicals, Linda? Where do they come from? Well, I don't know. You get them out of the bottles, and when the bottles are empty, you send up to the chemical store for more. It's the chemical store people who make them, I suppose, or else they send to the factory for them. I don't know. I never did any chemistry. My job was always with the embryos. It's the same with everything else he asked about. Linda never seemed to know. The old man of the Pueblo was much, had much more definite answers. The seed of man in all creatures. The seed of the sun and the seed of earth and the seed of the sky. Anawa and Ilona made all of them out of the fog of increase. Now the world has four wombs, and he laid the seeds in the lowest of the four wombs, and gradually the seeds began to grow. One day, John calculated later that it must have been soon after his fourth birthday. He came home and found a book he had never seen before lying on the floor in the bedroom. It was a thick book and looked very old. The biting had been eaten by mice and some of the pages were loose and crumbled. He picked it up, looked at the title page. The book was called The Complete Works of William Shakespeare. Linda was lying on the bed, sipping that horrible stinking mess call out of a cup. Hope they brought it, she said. Her voice was thick and hoarse like someone else's voice. It was lying in one of those chests at the Antelope Kiva. It's supposed to have been there for hundreds of years. I expect it's true because I looked at it and it seemed to be full of nonsense. Uncivilized. Still, it'll be good enough for you to practice your reading on. She took the last sip, set the cup down on the floor beside the bed, turned over on her side, hiccuped once or twice, and went to sleep. He opened the book at random. Nay, but to live in the sweet rank of the unseen bed, stool and corruption, hiding and making love over the nasty side. The strange words rolled through his mind, rumbled like, the rum like talking thunder, like the drums at the summer dances. If the drums could have spoken like the men singing the corn song, beautiful, beautiful, so that you cried like the old Mitsina saying magic over his feathers and his carved sticks and his bits of bone and the stone Kiapa Titsu. Sawoke, 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 I see lo, see lo, see, but better with than Mitsima's magic because it meant more, because it talked to him, talked wonderfully and only half understandably. A terrible, beautiful magic about Linda, about Linda lying there snoring, and the empty cup on the floor beside the bed, about Linda and Pope, Linda and Pope. He hated Pope more and more. A man can smile and smile and be a villain, remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, kindless villain. But what did exactly the words mean? But what did the words mean exactly? He only knit half knew. Their magic was strong and went on rumbling in his head, and somehow it was as though he had never really hated Pope before. Never really hated him because he had never been able to say how much he hated him. But now he had these words, these words like drums and singing and magic. These words and the strange, strange story out of which they were taken. He couldn't make heads or tails of it, but it was a wonderful, but it was wonderful, wonderful all the same. They gave him a reason for hating Pope. 
And they made his hatred more real. They even made Pope himself more real. One day, when he came in from playing, the door to the inner room was open, and he saw them lying together on the bed, asleep, White Linda and Pope almost black beside her, with one arm underneath under her shoulders and the other hand across her breast. On her breast, and one of the plates of his long hair lying across her throat, like a black snake trying to strangle her. Pope as Gordon Cope were standing on the floor and near the bed. Linda was snoring. His heart seemed to have disappeared and left a hole. It was empty, empty and cold and rather sick and giddy. He leaned against the wall to steady himself, remorseless, treacherous, lecherous, like drums, like the men singing for the corn, like magic. The words repeated and repeated themselves in his head. From the cold he was suddenly hot. His cheeks burned with the rush of blood. The room swam and darkened before his eyes. He ground his teeth. I'll kill him, I'll kill him, I'll kill him, he kept saying. And suddenly there were more words. When he is drunk asleep, or in his rage, or in that incestuous pleasure of his bed, the magic was on his side. The magic explained and gave orders. He stepped back in the outer room. When he is drunk asleep, the knife that is in for the meat was lying on the floor near the fireplace. He picked it up and tiptoed to the door again. When he is drunk asleep, drunk asleep, he ran across the room and stabbed, oh, the blood, stabbed again, and Pope heaved out, his, heaved out of his sleep. Lifted his hand to sit up once more and found his wrist caught. Held in, oh, whirl, oh, twist, he couldn't move, he was trapped. And there was Pope's small black eyes, very close, staring into his own. He looked away. There were two cuts on Pope's left shoulder. Oh, look at the blood, Linda was crying. Look at the blood. She had never been able to bear the sight of blood. Pope lifted his other hand to strike him, he thought. He stiffened to receive the blow. But the hand only took him under the chin and turned his face so that he had to look again into Pope's eyes. For a long time, for hours and hours, suddenly he couldn't help it. He began to cry. Both Pope burst out laughing. Go, he said, in the other Indian words. Go, my brave Ahuayuta. He ran out the other, to the other room to hide his tears. You are fifteen, said old Mitsima, in the Indian words. Now I may teach you to work with clay. Squatting by the river, they worked together. First of all, said Mitsima, taking him off the wetted clay between his hands, we make a little moon. The old man squeezed the lump into a disc and then bent up the edges. The moon soon became a shallow cup. Slowly and unskillfully, he imitated the old man's delicate gestures. A moon, a cup, and now a snake. Mitsima rolled out another piece of clay into a long, flexible cylinder, trooped it along the circle, and pressed it into the rim of the cup. Then another snake, and another, and another. Round by round, by round Mitsima built up the sides of the pond. It was narrow, it bulged, it narrowed again towards the neck. It seemed to squeeze and padded, stroked and scraped. And there was, then at last it stood, in the shape, the familiar, ah, in shape the familiar water pot of my pice, but creamy white instead of black, and still soft to the touch. The crooked parody of Mitsima's, his own, stood beside it, looking at the two pots he had to laugh. But the next will be better, he said, and began to moisten another piece of clay. To fashion, to give form, to feel his fingers gaining in skill and power. This gave him an extraordinary pleasure. A, B, C, vitamin D, he sang as he worked. The fats in the liver, the cots in the sea. And Mitsima also sang along a song about killing a bear. They worked all day, and all day he was filled with intense, absorbing happiness. Next winter, said, Miss, said old Mitsima, I will teach you to make the boat. He stood for a long time outside the house, and at last the ceremonies within were finished. The doors opened and they came out. Kofu was first, his right hand outstretched and tightly closed, as though some, as though over some precious jewel. Her clenched hand similarly outstretched. Ki uh, Kiakime followed. They walked in silence, and in silence behind them came the brothers and sisters and the cousins and the whole troop of old people. They walked out of the pueblo across the mesa. At the edge of the cliff they halted, facing the early morning sun. Kofu opened his hand, a pinch of cornmeal lay white on the spoon. He breathed on it, murmured a few words, and then threw it, a handful of white dust towards the sun. Kiakime did the same. Then Kiakime's father stepped forward, and holding a feathered prayer stick, made a long prayer, and threw the stick after the cornmeal. It is finished, said old Mitsima in a loud voice. They are married. Well, said Linda, as they turned away, all I can say is, it does seem like a lot of fuss to make to make about something so little. In civilized country, when the boy wants a girl, he just, where are you going, John? He paid no attention to her calling, but ran on away, away anywhere to be by himself.
It is finished, old Mitzima. His words repeated themselves in his mind. Finished, finished, in silence and from a long way off. But violently and desperately, hopelessly, he had, he had loved Kia Kime, and now it was finished. He was sixteen. At the full moon in the Antelope Kiva, secrets would be told. Secrets would be done and born. They would go down, boys, into the Kiva and come again, men. The boys were all afraid and at the same time impatient. At last it was the day. The sun went down, the moon rose. He went with the others, men standing dark at the entrance to the Kiva. To the ladder went the ladder went down into the red lighted depths. Already the leading boys had begun to climb down. Suddenly one of the men stepped forward, caught him by the arm, and pulled him out of the ranks. He broke free and dodged back into his place among the others. This time the man struck him, pulled his hair. Not for you, white hair. Not for the son of the she dog, said another one of the men. The boys laughed. Go! And he was still hovering and he still hovered on the fringe of the group. Go! the men shouted again. One of them bent down and took a stone through it. Go! 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 There was a shower of stones. Bleeding, he ran away into the darkness. From the red-lit kiva came the noise of singing. The last of the boys had climbed down the ladder. He was all alone. All alone outside the Pueblo, on the bare stone of, on the bare plain of the mesa. The rock was like the bleached bones in the moonlight. Down in the valley, the coyotes were howling at the moon. The bruises hurt him, the cuts still bleeding. But it was not for the pain he saw. It was because he was all alone, because he had been driven out, alone, and in the skeleton world of rocks and moonlight. Into the skeleton world of rocks and moonlight. God, that At the edges of the precipice he sat down. The moon was behind him. He looked back into the... He looked down into the black shadow of the mesa, into the black depth, into the black shadow of death. He only had to take one step, one little jump. He held out his right hand in the moonlight. From the cut on his wrist, the blood was still oozing. Every few seconds, a drop fell, dark, almost colorless in the dead light. Drop, drop, drop. Tomorrow and tomorrow and tomorrow, he had discovered time and death and God. Alone, always alone, the young man was saying. The words awoke a plaintive echo in Bernard's mind. Alone, alone. So am I, he said, on a gush of confidence, confiding this. Terribly alone. Are you? John looked surprised. I thought that in the other place, I mean, Linda said that nobody was ever alone there. Bernard blushed uncomfortably. You see, he said, mumbling in with averted eyes, I'm rather different from most people, I suppose. It happens to be, if, if one happens to be the Canton different. Yes, that's just it, the young man nodded. If one's different, one's bound to be lonely. They're beastly to one. Do you know they shut me out of absolutely everything? When the other boys were sent out to spend the night in the mountains, you know, when you have to dream in which of your sacred animal is, they wouldn't let me go with the others. They wouldn't tell me any of the secrets. I did it by myself, though, he added. Didn't eat anything for five days and then went out one night alone in those mountains there, he pointed. Patronizingly, Bernard smiled. And did you dream of anything, he asked. The other nodded. But I mustn't tell you what. He was silent for a little while. For a little. Then in a low voice, once, he went on, I did something that none of the others did. I stood against a rock in the middle of the day in the summer with my arms out like Jesus on the cross. What on earth for? I wanted to know what it was like being crucified, hanging there in the sun. But why? Why? Well, he hesitated. Because I felt I ought to. If Jesus could stand it, and then if one's done something wrong, besides, I was unhappy, and there was another reason. It seems a funny way of curing your unhappiness, said Bernard, but on a second thought, but on second thoughts he decided there was, after all, with some sense in it, better than taking so. I fainted after a time, said the young man, fell down on my face. Do you see the mark where I cut myself? He lifted the thick yellow hair from his forehead. The scar showed pale and puckered on his right temple. Bernard looked and then quickly, with a little shudder, averted his eyes. His conditioning had made him not so much pitiful as profoundly squeamish. The mere suggestion of illness or wounds was to him not only horrifying, but even repulsive and rather disgusting, like dirt or deformity or old age. Hastily, he changed the subject. I wonder if you'd like to come back to London with us, he asked, making the first move in a campaign whose strategy he had been secretly elaborating ever since on the little house he had realized who the father of this young savage must be. Would you like that? The young man's face lit up. Do you really mean it? Of course, if I can get permission, that is. Linda, too? 
Well, he hesitated doubtfully. The revolt, that revolting creature? No, it was impossible. Unless, unless, it suddenly occurred to Bernard that her very revoltingness might prove to be an enormous asset. But of course, he cried, making up for his first hesitations with excess of noisy cordiality. The young man drew in a deep breath. To think it should be coming true, that I've dreamt of all my life. Do you remember what Miranda says? Who's Miranda? But the young boy had evidently not heard the question. Oh, wonder, he was saying, and his eyes shone. His face was brightly flushed. How many goodly creatures are there here? How beauteous mankind is. The flush suddenly deepened. He was thinking of Lenina, of an angel with in bottle green viscose, lustrous with youth and skin food. Plump, benevolently smiling, his voice faltered. Oh, brave new world, he began, and then suddenly interrupted himself. The blood had left his cheeks. He was pale as paper. Are you married to her? he asked. Am I what? Married, you know, forever. They say forever in the Indian words, it can't be broken. For no, Bernard couldn't help laughing. John also laughed, but for another reason, laughed of for pure joy. Oh, brave new world, he repeated. Oh, brave new world that has such people in it. Let's start at once. You have a most peculiar way of talking sometimes, said Bernard, staring at the young man in a perplexed astonishment. And anyhow, maybe hadn't you better wait till you actually see the new world? 